here this afternoon with Ronald Wade, the director of the State Anatomy Board. We'd like to hear more information about the program. Well, the Anatomy Board's Board of the Health Department, and we're a state entity, so we're serving the public interest, and we do that in two ways as far as the Anatomy Board. When it was created in 1947, the purpose of the Anatomy Board was on a statewide basis to take care of someone who dies and no one claims the body, so it was the means of state disposition. But at that time, there was a great need to study anatomy in the medical schools. We had two main medical schools, Johns Hopkins University and the University of Maryland, where we were located. So that was the mean by which they had bodies to study anatomy, and uh, the state would get the public health interest in use of the body and then provide a state disposition. In 1962-63, the laws in Maryland changed where someone can donate their body, the use of their body. Your body is your proprietary property. So you can donate the use of your body, make an anatomical gift, to advance and enhance medical education, research study, and, and clinical training. Okay, that's like uh, leaving a legacy. You're leaving a legacy for the next generation to have a better life after you're gone. You know, you can't take things with you, but you know, if you're going to leave something, Including that's a good thing to leave. Okay. Um, so how has the program grown? Um, do we need to tell more people about it? How has it advanced um, in, in the community, in the state of Maryland, maybe? Well, for many years ago, the, the traditional method was to bury. Um, someone would be buried in a family plot or in a, in a cemetery like, you know, it's Loudon Park, one of the large cemeteries here. Uh, but as time has progressed and, and more and more people consider cremation, for example, and the state, we, we don't have potter's fields and boot hills around here. So, uh, when, when, because of the law of Maryland, we would take care of unclaimed bodies through the anatomy board. Uh, we offer the donation as an alternative means of disposition that the state would handle in that uh, there's no cost to the family uh, for handling that. It's, it's basically a cremation and there's a delay in the disposition. But to meet the public interest and the public needs and the family's needs, part of the donor program is to return the ashes back to the family. There, that way they can have them buried, entombed, scattered, do whatever they want. There's no actual specific law that says they have to do any particular thing once they get the ashes. That's very nice. So the family still is a part of what goes on. Oh, definitely. I mean, the first concern as a public official I have is what is the peace of mind of the family? And I've always believed, coming from a funeral home background, I've always believed that the family should have all options and alternatives available to them because they're the decision maker. It's what's, what's in their best interest to do given the fact they're dealing with the death and the grief. And so what we try to do is support that in the ways that we can. So it's not, it's, it, there's flexibility with, even within the donor program. Okay. So that kind of helps with closure. It does. Oftentimes we need. Oh, that word. <laughs> yes. Yes, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, but the, the reason I say that is it doesn't close. When you've lost someone, you still have memories. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that, you know, the, the idea of closure, it's changing. Things change because you're learning to live without the person there. You're learning to adapt and modify to make do with what he did, maybe someone else has to do. But you're also having to accept the permanency of the death and what that means in changing your life and how that impacts it. So it doesn't close. Nothing closes. Okay. Transition. It, it's a transition. It's, it's a rite of passage. Right. Right. Um, so, with with the program uh, and its advancing, um, how does one find out about making the donation? Or um, you know, while we're alive, we can, you know, I know about um, donor parts, but for the whole body. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's interesting because um, I've been there a long time. Actually, I'd, I've been there forty some years. So, when they passed the driver's license law, for example, for organ donors, I was that's I was there then and they cited the anatomy board law. But the way the program is set up, it's set up to be, um, to, to promote the public interest in the common good. So for example, if you're an organ donor and your driver's license, that has no impact on your body donation. As a matter of fact, you can do both. We encourage you to do both. If, if what you're trying to do is help the next generation, if you have organs and tissues that can be transplanted, and, and you and your family's okay with that, that should happen first before the body comes to the anatomy board. We, because we have so many programs and so many things we interact with, we can work around various conditions and, and things that have happened during that person's life, realizing that most of our donors are between 70 and 100 years old. You know, they've had a long life. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's unusual to get someone younger than that, unless it's a you know kind of a devastating disease like cancer or something like a trauma. Mm -hmm. But when you donate the anatomy board, we don't reject the donation based upon disease or trauma, so that we can work around those things in order to create the greatest good we can from that gift that's made, and that gives it more meaning for the family. That that helps the family to get through this course of bereavement, knowing that that they've done all they could to support what the donor wanted. All right. Um, what I found interesting was that there's no medical ex uh, acceptance qualification for donation. No. Being a state entity, we're, we run a lot different than in most states each medical school runs their own program. And it's based upon those medical school needs. They don't accept anyone that may be infectious, for example, that has TB or hepatitis or something like that. When putting this program together, though, when someone signs a dinner form, they may die 25 years from now. Mm -hmm. They don't know what they're going to die from, in most cases. It's a little strange when they do, though. But, but you know, they may die from a disease or condition that would make the body unsuitable for those medical school programs. But like I said, for the anatomy board, we're part of the health department. So our interest is to promote public health and well-being. If someone has donated and 10 years later develops hepatitis, rather than reject the body, the body comes into us because there still may be a need for research tissue to obtain from that person that has that affective disease or condition. For example, when HIV first started back in the mid-80s, you know, we were getting patients that had HIV, so we were able to get tissue from them that could aid in the research for HIV. So, you know, to close things off, we, most schools have a weight limit. They don't want someone that's maybe over 180 pounds, okay? Um, but we don't, we don't qualify donations at all because we don't know what the, it, it's based upon your intent. You want to make a donation, you send me the form, I put it in the file. So from my point of view, I've accepted that. And the only one that can cancel that would be you. So at the time of death, you know, it, and it, it, they've done this estate planning, it's kind of a given for the family that the body's going to be donated. Even if it was a medical examiner's case, a car accident, and the body's not suitable for use, mm -hmm. and the body would come to me, and what I'm going to do is cremate the body fairly quickly at the behest of the family for their, for their well, common good, that's what we would do. Because many times we have families donating, not just one, but other people in the family. Mm. It's much like the traditional funeral home that builds up a client base. Right. It's pretty much like that. And we're with Ron Wade. Um, the director of the uh, State Anatomy Board. Uh, Ron, we were laughing about several things, and, and actually you made me laugh. There's a euphemism about peace of mind, uh, closure, uh, guarantees about ashes and bodies and um, people's concerns. Yeah, well, having grown up in a funeral home, and I, I, I'm a licensed mortician, I've worked in that, but having been a director of the Anatomy Board for over 40 years, you you run into a lot of situations, and, and sometimes it can be very heart-wrenching and emotional and all that. And, and sometimes when you listen to people, they, they're, they're looking for some relief. Mm -hmm. And so rather than be so solemn and mundane and morbid, sometimes, you know, you need to lighten them up a little bit. And for example, when my father died, he was a funeral director. And I had a lot of funeral directors coming up to me saying, well, I hear you lost your father. I'm really sorry you lost your father. And I said, no, I didn't lose him. I know exactly where he is. We put him in the veteran <laughs> cemetery. But we have ways of, of, it's uncomfortable to talk to family and friends right. about a death. And so part of human behavior is, is uh, a lot of times people avoid it. But in other ways, people kind of come off with speak like, you know, your dad passed. Well, no, actually my dad failed because he died of heart failure. Mm -hmm. So it's the way we talk because we think we're, we're benefiting them. It's like a lot of people will say the remains. The ashes, they call, funeral directors will call them cremains now. So we get we, these cute little words and mm -hmm. things like that, you know. And, and for example, the anatomy board is a body donation program. It's not the remains, it's a body. That's what it is. And so when they're having to plan for the disposition, it's disposition of the body. The body was of their father. But for many people, depending upon where they are, you know, many people see that as that's not their father. That was the shell that the father was in. The father's gone. He's, he's transitioned out. But this is the mortal remains. Right. And, and the father left the mortal remains for someone to have a better use and, and maybe someone to benefit from the use of the body, say, develop their surgical skills or their trauma skills. 
I was in, I was in the medical corps in Vietnam um, during the Vietnam era, and and you know the medics are concerned with breathing and bleeding. Keep them breathing and stop the bleeding. So many people donate their bodies are used for paramedic EMT certification, and that is very important when they get a 911 call because you want the you want the paramedic EMT confident, knowing exactly what he's exactly. going to do and save the life. Mm -hmm. Now if he if the guy lives long enough and he gets to trauma within that first hour. 90% chance he's going to live. So it's it's good stuff. It's it's about how you you know, how you word it. It's how I you approach it. Approach it like that. Now, uh, along with approach, what kind of guarantees? Um, for instance, we we know a lot about um, hearing different things about a cemetery or or a funeral home that was supposed to bury a body. They buried just the casket, and the body was found someplace else um, with ashes. Um, how do I know I'm getting my family or that person's ashes. Yeah. Well, speaking for the anatomy board first, um, we have all licensed staff. I have five uh, licensed mortuary services. Most of them are funeral director morticians and a few are mortuary transport services that are now registered. I have two licensed crematories under contract and we have a lot of checks and balances and, and all of that. When I have a body sent to the crematory, it's, it's in a cremation container it's got a number, it's got a name, it goes to the crematory, it's transported there by a mortician, so, and then it's cremated, and the ashes are, there's a control process for that. When the ashes are returned to me, that we check that, because there's a certificate that has to accompany that that says these are the cremated remains of. So I, I'm very parental over the donor program, having, when I first got there, we were getting 80 to 100 bodies a year, and last year we had 2,400 bodies come to the anatomy wow. board. So it's, it's been very successful for, for what it is intended to do, but, you know, it, like I said, you have to, I'm very parental about it, but you have to, you're dealing with family members and, and their, the concerns about what's going on with their loved ones. It's just like ordinarily, I don't call back to the families and let them know how the body was, what kind of study, how the body was used for education or training, but many times I'll have families calling me up wanting to know because it's important to them that the wish was carried out. And so then at that point, we, we respond very favorably to the family. There's instances where the family wants to divide the ashes. <clears throat> Maybe have the urn buried at the cemetery, veteran cemetery, for example, but each of the siblings or, or children would like to have a sampling of the ashes. And that's not a problem. We can do that, and, and, and it affords them peace of mind. Mm -hmm. There's no specific requirement that any particular thing needs to be done. Uh, what bothers me is when, you know, um, you have a, a man die and the widow, and they're in their 80s, man dies for a shooter, and the little widow comes up and, and you say, well, what are you going to do with the ashes, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to keep them. Well, no, but okay, keep them for a while, but what are you going to do with them? What's the end point? I'm going to keep them. And I try to get them to think about some, some end point of peace of mind that, that take them to a favorite place or a cemetery, family plot. Right. Do something, because 30 years from now, you may have a great-great-grandson looking for a relative, mm -hmm. and there's no record at all, because once the cremation's been done, ordinarily there's no record with the state about what happens to the urn or the ashes. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you know, people are going to just kind of disappear. Uh, it's speaking nice of, to have a record. Speaking of urn, you don't supply the urn. No. When, when we have a cremation done, it comes back in a container that is uh, like a polypropylene plastic. You know, a lot of people think of an urn kind of like a bronze vase. Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't want to bury one in the ground, and, and you don't need to anyway uh, if you're going to inter it. You know, you don't need to buy a bronze vase, and, and now they have <clears throat> what they call urn vaults, which are kind of, they're, they're plastic, but they look like marble, or, and they're heavy, mm -hmm. and, and so they can be buried, or you can put them on a mantle if that's what you want to do for a short term temporary kind of a thing. But if you bury them, there is a concern about having the ground settle. So that's why they're encased. Cemeteries require some sort of hard container okay. if you're going to bury them. We're going to take a quick break. Um, we're here speaking with Ron Wade from the Maryland State Board of Anatomy, and we'll be right back. Well, we're back from our break. We're here with Ronald uh, Wade the uh, director for the State Anatomy Board of Mar Maryland. Uh, we're getting some rather great information about how to uh, donate um, bodies or our bodies 
or someone's <laughs> body. A body. A body. Um, and uh, I understand that there there is a sort of a guarantee, or or there are checks and balances, because people are concerned about sure. um, integrity you know, and honesty of the program. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and so um, I understand there's a peace of mind that you that you afford the uh, bereaved, or mm -hmm. how do you how do you say it? Um, I would like to talk a little bit more about the paper, well, the paperwork. Okay. Um, I, I'm sure that there is some paperwork, or we have to read. There are questions that have to be answered. Um, how difficult well, is it? Well, actually, the donor form to donate your body is very simple in Maryland. Um, unlike other donor programs, uh, there may be several pages, and they ask for medical qualifications, and they have various, you know, questions that delve into a history, which may not even apply years down the road. So. For the most part, our donor, donor form are two short little paragraphs. First paragraph deals with intent. What is the intention? What, what are you intending on doing by donating? What's the intent? The intent is, is that you're donating and giving prop, proprietary interest to property rights in the body to the anatomy board so that the body would be used to advance and enhance medical education research study. And that the, you know, based upon the form, the uh, cremation will occur and you're authorizing that and then the ash is returned to the family. The second paragraph really is more of authority. It gives us the authority to exclusive right to the custody, control, the preparation, the use of the body, and then the cremation of the body. So it's that simple. Mm -hmm.